We've done podcasts on abortion, on Halloween, and on other things about our country being a, a country that worships death. But how should the church instill a culture of life? Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Sides. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. You know, as a, as a nation, we've killed something like 65 million babies through, through physical abortion, not to mention all the ones that have been killed with, with the pill and other things. We have, we're a nation where the youth are killing themselves at an enormous rate, an ever-increasing rate. We have people that basically use drugs to the point that they kill themselves all over the place. You know, in San Francisco, a lot more people have died of opioid than died of COVID, even though they make such a big deal about COVID. Heroin and those are a lot worse. Uh, we have Halloween's our second biggest holiday. We have schools that are filled with people who cut themselves. We have piercings, tattoos, all these things that re- just reflect that we as a nation worship death. So what should the church do about that? So I think before we can really answer that question, the church has to be honest with itself about its influence on the world. I mean, one of the things I think that we talk about a lot on here is that the church is the light of the world, the church is the salt of the earth, and we say that the church really does influence the world. But the church frequently likes to play games with whether it pushes the world or whether the world is in charge. And there's this part of it where when you look at abortion being legal in the United States for as long as it was, I think there's some parts where where the church goes, that wasn't our fault. It wasn't our fault that abortion was legal in the United States, but I think we do have to own up and say, no, it was the church's fault that abortion became legal in the United States. And in the end, for abortion to become legal, we already had to have somewhat of a culture of death in the United States. And so there's this part of it where we actually have to, if we're going to say we can instill a culture of death, we have to actually look back and say, what things should we repent of? Because in the end, The reason why abortion became legal is because the church was not salt. The church was not light. The church had not been saying we need that life is something that must be being pushed actively, that must be celebrated, that that has responsibility. And in the end, that that moment of our in our history was a result of our sins. And so I think that's kind of where you have to start is that the church doesn't value life and we haven't valued life for a long time. And we need to really think about what it means to value life. And I think part of the picture is, I mean, it's the picture of a seed and the the plant that grows, right? We look at things that we're seeing now, like abortion, like like the suicide rate, all these things. And we go, that's the, the terrible thing, but that's the fruit of things that were planted well before that. And things that I would argue that the church continues to plant, continues to sow, and then it's surprised that it reaps the fruit that, is the natural fruit of sowing those things. So I had a question when you were talking about the the church being honest about its influence in the world. What are you teasing out there? Are you teasing out the influence that the church has or the influence that the church ought to have? I'm saying both in a sense. I mean, the church, so the church is either an active influence on the world or it's an absence of an influence on the world. And there's a part of it where the spirit of God animates the church and the world is, the world is, dr- the world is driven by the light it can see. There's a part of it where, I mean, we, we always think of darkness as something that has power, but the truth is, is darkness flees from light. If the church was doing what it was supposed to do, the darkness would be fleeing more. And so when you see darkness increasing, there can be things that you can do to make places darker. I mean, there are, there are ways to make places darker, but the easiest way to do is to turn the light down, to have the light go out. And so if the church isn't shining forth the light, the world responds. And so, I mean, it is the church's responsibility when you see the world growing darker, when you see areas growing darker, it is because the church is not shining forth the light. It is because the church is not doing those things. And I think we just, it's so easy for us to go, the world, the world, the world, the world is doing all these things. The world does this, the world does this. And we don't sit back and go, wait a minute. It's like parents who, who work, who, my children do this, my children do this, my children do this, and they don't think that they have a responsibility to drive the home. They don't have a responsibility to shape the home. They act like they're not in charge. And the church really does this, have this level of power. I mean, you could say most of the people at this particular podcast can say, hey, abortion being legal wasn't my fault because that all happened before I was born, you know. 
And, but, right. So, you know, the question is, well, how much responsibility should I have for that? And I do think there's a part where you can say, I inherited these things, but you should also recognize that you're the, you are the inheritor of them and you have to repent of them because they've, they've grown up around you. They're a part of the culture that you inherited. And if you don't turn away from it, it won't get turned away from. And so you're either going to perpetuate what you've been handed or you're going to change it and walk away from those things. And I think that's what repentance really is. And when you look at John 1, right, John 1 says, all men walk according to the light that Christ brought into the world. That every, I mean, right. all, the, all the light that anybody sees by is because of Christ. And the church as the body of Christ needs to understand that when Christ isn't here, that, that light is supposed to be shown through his church, right? Which is what it says on the Sermon on the Mount. And so I think the church is really quick to go, no, that's just how the world is, instead of going, no, we actually have responsibility, and we're supposed to be overcoming it, right? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be on the offense. So even when we say the previous generation didn't you know, let the, the battle line you know, retreat, if you will, that doesn't change our responsibility. Our responsibility is still to move it forward. And if we haven't, we still have culpability there, I think. I so mean, when we – sorry, go ahead. So, I mean, both both your responses, it sounds like there's a, there's a sense in which the church has abdicated some of its roles in it leading the culture. But my guess is as we talk through these topics, we're going we're gonna to keep h- hitting that. But then we're also going to be saying things about, hey, look – this is the way the church has actively participated in promoting the culture of death that we've talked about on other podcasts. And right. I think one of the major problems is the church calls a lot of things that are darkness. They call it light. And that's a dangerous thing when you read Isaiah and God says, woe to those who call darkness light and light darkness, you know, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so, you know, evil good, you know, good for evil, all of those are tied up in there. And it's really easy for the church to be saying these things that, oh, we're walking in the light. And they're not really, they're calling light darkness. And we need to really weed that out of the church. So, so when we're talking about a culture of life that's, you know, set against the world's culture of death, what, what do we mean by that? I think that it means that we, that there are certain things that we assume already that that we're bringing to the table and with this discussion that we haven't even talked about yet like well we say that churches should value life why you know why why should the church value life um and biblically there's answers for that i think people par- part of the reason people just go well of, c- of course we value life it's sort of like when you have a discussion with someone about love and you ask them, well, what is love? And it's insulting to suggest they might not know what love is and to say, do you really value life? And people just, well, of course I value life, but that's not how it works out in actual practice. That's not how, it's everything from our attitude towards how we like prevent children through prophylactics, through birth control methods. It's everything from pornography, the way we view, you know, the way we view women, the way we view the role of women, the way we view motherhood, the way we view the elderly, the way we view the handicapped. I mean, there are all these attitudes about these things that it's it's so easy to think about life and you think about these perfect pictures of life, but there's all these different avenues of life that are much more complex and you build your culture around them. You build your culture around how you treat the elderly, how you treat your parents, how you do you you know, do you think of their wisdom as something that needs to be gained? Do you Are they part of your life or are they something that's distant? All those things are part of our attitude towards life. And so it's really easy to say, of course, I value life, but your practices really aren't informed by a biblical definition of the way you should handle these things. I think that the statement like that is pretty safe to assume when you're talking in Christian church circles. But you go just one tiny step outside that and... I'm not as sure that that's going to be the obvious, you know, do you value life? Well, right. I mean, have you listened to death metal lately? <laughs> right. I hope not. I mean, right. but or even think historically, would you consider a spectator at a Roman gladiatorial games to be somebody who thought, oh, yeah, I really value life? I mean, would, would that be, would they even care to answer that question one way or the, the other? I mean, the only reason that we would think that it's a virtue to value life like we do is because of the influence of Christianity through the world. And I mean, and there's a lot of things that we do that, that have a testimony of not valuing life. And by we, I mean the broader church, the visible church. 
I mean, hey, NASCAR. One of the reasons NASCAR is interesting is you're wondering if somebody's going to flip out and kill themselves. The reason that, you know, the reason that they play these video games where everybody shoots everybody else is because it's about death. And I mean, there's other things that are attractive there. I'm not saying that's the only thing, but we're not repulsed at the idea of death. And we should actually be repulsed at it. There was also a certain kind of repulsion because a lot of the Bible talks about a lot of death. Absolutely. And, you know, and there's even glory of God. You know, God is a warrior. God's killing his enemies. So there, so there's a certain type of repulsion to death, but it's not like universal. Don't even mention it. I would argue that the cornerstone of having a culture of life is to remember why life's valuable. And that's right from the beginning in Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is why life's valuable. And when we lose this idea, and when the church loses this idea that life's valuable, they're always going to replace other things with why, why this person's valuable. Instead of saying, no, they're valuable because they're made in the image of God. So as soon as you lose that, I think you always end up with a culture of death. When you lose the idea that man's made in God's image. And there's, there's two big themes in that phrase. And the one that we tend to key on is, oh, we're made in God, we're, we're made in God's image. We, we key in on the mm-hmm. God's image part. Um, in that first, that phrase is used twice, but you know what's said three times here is God made them. Mm-hmm. And both, you can't get away from both those things. And, you know, if you, if you want to say, hey, we're, we live in a world that God made and not in a world that happened by random chance, not the result of evolutionary processes, um, that that there is somebody above it all who's looking down on it and made it because he liked it. It pleased him to do it. And you start there, and then you build on top of that, and you say, well, and man is particularly important because God made him male and female. He created them. And it's one of these things where, I mean, just something as simple as fixating on the heaviness of these words actually starts to change practices. Because there's a part of it where it means that if you ingrain into yourself that other people are made in the image of God. Whenever I am sitting on my phone and my children are trying to get my attention and I'm doing something stupid on my phone, I've forgotten that my children are made in the image of God. When you have a conversation with someone and you're not really giving them your attention and you're not giving them the worth that they are, you're forgetting that they're made in the image of God. And there is just this fun, I mean, the weight of those words right there actually start to shape culture if you actually believe them. And so, I mean, I think it's this is what I meant by it's so fundamental. People go, of course we love life, but when you actually sit back and go, do I give it the do I give it the preeminence that God has given it? Do I give it for the reason that God has given it? Do I give it the dignity and the honor that it's meant to have because doing that glorifies God? All of a sudden, lots of little things start to ripple and shape and be shaped as opposed to just going, well, I know what life is and I value it, which we what we know we value is our own life to a certain extent. <laughs> and that's just called selfishness. <laughs> Which, cause that's the, I mean, that's the difference between, you know, you go out on the street and you ask the average person, do you value life? They're probably going to say yes. Right. But the way they value life isn't in a Christian way where you're recognizing that life is given by God, that people are made in the image of God, and therefore life has value. For most people, I think the value would come down to, you know, I enjoy being alive. I can do fun things while I'm alive. And even other people, I'm not having fun that they're alive necessarily. But I recognize that if, you know, we, you know, just kill whoever we want, well, someone might kill me. Right. And I know that I like my life, and so I don't want to kill other people. Right. And so, but then you get to, you know, like children in the womb. Well, I don't remember being a child in the womb. Does it even, do they even know what is happening to them? Or an elderly person. Well, my life's not fun anymore. Do I have to keep living my life? And so, so when you start to push the boundaries of it, you see that there's a vast difference between the secular idea of the value of life and the Christian one. And you look at how God pu- pushes the boundary, right? The, the book of Jonah in the last chapter, God rebukes Jonah because he's upset that Nineveh was saved, right? And God doesn't just say, but look at all those people. He also says, look at all the people and cattle. And so when he talks about life, he doesn't narrow it and say, look at your life. He expands and says, you should even be considering the cattle of the field, right? The righteous take care of their animals. I mean, this is in Proverbs. Right. And so, you know, I think we, we have this tendency to narrow the definition like Joshua was talking about. And that's not what God does. He does the opposite. 
which doesn't mean that you can't kill and eat an animal because it says that as well. But it means even then you consider their life and you consider their purpose and you consider why God made them. Right. The lazy man doesn't even roast what he took in hunting, right? I mean, the, it says the lazy man just, I mean, he might let the food just rot. As someone who's who's been wasteful in that way, it's really, it's it's very easy to do that because there's just, there's work involved in this thing. And you know what I mean? There's a part of where you're, you're saying, if you're going to go and kill an animal for food, you should consider the fact that you killed it for food and be serious about those things. And that's, I mean, that's real. Not that you... That's considering the life and you're saying right. there's a purpose for that life. Right. But the purpose for that life isn't some kind of utility, uh, necessarily. Right. It's it starts with God made it, and God made it with particular features. But and He not, commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. Right. So one of the ways that I think you know that you end up moving towards a culture of death is you start to look at usefulness of somebody rather than just the fact that they are. Is that and so when a church starts to show partiality towards certain people, and we've seen this really widespread in the church, right? I mean, with so many of the sex scandals, they go so far because, like the Ravi Zacharias, it goes a lot further because they're going, but he's Ravi Zacharias. I mean, there was enough clues way before that, but they're going, but he's so useful. And we measure usefulness instead of just saying, no, they're made in God's image, they're God's creature. And, and that's a very dangerous thing because we're not in a position to judge usefulness at all. I mean, not at all, because God's the one who gets to judge usefulness. And you see the same thing in the arguments about abortion. I mean, you know, go back a couple decades and, and the arguments in favor of abortion where it's not a baby, it's a, it's a fetus, it's a clump of cells. They're really bad arguments, and everybody knows that they're really bad arguments. So more sophisticated if you if you look at the professional literature on this the people who are arguing in favor of abortion right now most persuasively just cop to the fact that yes it's a baby yes it's a human but here's reasons why you can justifiably kill a human being an innocent human being and one of those reasons that's often used is the utility or the potential utility right. of somebody so for example if this person that is yet to be born has got significant fetal deformities, they've got some kind of congenital defect, then their usefulness, the quality of life that they have and can share with others is smaller than a regular person. Therefore, you can kill them. And I think even the most obvious one by the conservatives is, you know, the exception in the case of the life of the mother. You know, if it's really in the case of the life of the mother where you have to say that there's two lives here and which one should be saved, but that's not what really happens. The life of the mother is almost always you're exaggerating the risk to the child or the child, you know, it's an atopic pregnancy and you need to, uh, to cut it out anyway. And there's other things, although that gets complicated, but because a lot of times that doesn't risk the life of the mother. If that's found out ahead of time, it rarely risks the life of the mother. That's usually that they bleed out before they get to the hospital if you want to know all the details. But, you know, they come up with these things because what they're saying is, in the end, even though we believe it's a life, we think the mother's life, because she's full grown, it has more utility than the baby's life. Right. Because in the end, the argument, they don't I mean, they don't want to say we should try to save both lives, and sometimes you can't. They want to say, because of this, we just were, we should just kill one of them. And that's, I mean... Because it might risk the life of the mother, we should kill the baby. Right. And that's, that's just a totally different argument than, I mean, in most scenarios, what you do is you try to save both lives, and you do everything you can. Right. I mean, it's the type of situation isn't, you know, a firefighter can only carry out one person at a time. It's the situation is, should I throw my children to the bear so I can get away? I mean, right. that's kind of what it comes down right. to, is the way that it's, it's actually looked at. And I do think that what you said about usefulness in the end, I mean, there there are lots of scenarios where we can look at usefulness and weigh things. Like you talked about, like, with regarding the life of an animal, there's, with animals and things, there are usefulness arguments that can be made. Animals aren't made in the image of God. But when you get to the a man being made in the image of God, like you said, we have no basis to say, God does not say, I made men in the image of God, some of them more useful than others, and use your discretion. God said, I made all men in the image of God, all men in the image of God, all men and women. I mean, and he's very, very clear about that. And so it just, it isn't a criteria that we can use when it comes to 
should we kill this person or not? Unless God specifically commands us to, right? Because an example of that would be a murderer. Well, you're supposed to put them to death so that other people see and fear, right? That's what the Bible says. And so when they have the two or three witnesses against them and they're a murderer, then you know, because God has revealed it to you, what their utility is, which is to die so that other people fear. And at that point, you go, we should kill them because that's what God said to do. Right. But even then, it's really not you evaluating their usefulness in the way that we want to think of it as usefulness. Right. You know it's I mean? really that God has revealed his usefulness exactly. for their life. Right. And I mean, I think that's a really important thing because when we look at somebody and say, this person's useful and this person's not, we're always looking at it from a physical standpoint and not a spiritual standpoint. But God has much more concern about spiritual things than physical things. So we are just so far from being able to judge. And a selfish viewpoint. I mean, you know, I mean, because in the end, usefulness is always relative to the person who's doing the evaluating. So you're asking, are they useful to me? Are they useful to this other person? And they're, well, like, you could say, are they... Are they perceived to be useful for the church even? Sure, but I'm just saying, but in the, the end, it's still, I'm just saying, it's still this thing of you're going, is this, is this what can do it? And that's just, it's just not, and God has said, it's not something you can evaluate. Right, we're just not in the position to be a judge. Like, you know, when God is appointing David as king, and all his brothers stand before him, right? First Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God understands, and God looks at it, and he's the one that's saying, this is a vessel for honor, this is a vessel for dishonor, this is what my purpose is for them, to bring me glory. And it's really arrogant of us, right, to put ourselves in that place of God and say, we can make that judgment. He's telling you, your decision will be biased, if that's what you're doing, because you will only be able to look at the outward appearance. You're always so stuck with the physical. Right, you're going to judge based on that. And there's so many things that God considers to be precious in his sight. Like a meek and submissive heart, he says, is precious in his sight. You know, he says, precious are the prayers of the saints. These things that, that can be very hard, to, right? Most people wouldn't look at Moses and say, there's the meekest man in the world. But yet God looks at him and says, there's the meekest man in the world. And so... We just need to, to recognize that so many things that God con- t- considers to be valuable, man shouldn't even see or cannot see. Right. That, that one person, when Moses is standing there and saying to the Levites, everybody grab your sword and let's go through the camp and kill everybody who's you know, worshiping the golden calf. Well, he doesn't seem very meek there, but God's saying, no, his, his heart's meek and it's precious in my sight. And there's a great deal of things that, that we do for God, that God even tells us that we should make hidden from others. I mean, there's a, there's an aspect of our service that God says not to, not to make these things public. In Matthew 6, 2 through 4, it says, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will himself reward you openly. And so God's even just telling us very, you know, flat, you know, flat out, there are those who are going to obey me, and they're going to do things that you could never evaluate, because they've done them in a way that you don't, you're not even aware of them. And in fact, they're not supposed to tell you about them. There's another verse that says, don't let your own lips praise you, but the lips of another. I mean, and so there's this there's this part of it where if you were sitting there going, I need, I can, I can evaluate other people. God has actually commanded those who who serve Him to do good deeds in a way that you couldn't evaluate their deeds. Right, and He says that some men's deeds go before them, and some men's deeds come after them in terms of being seen by the people around them. And so, you just, you just right. can't know, nor are we supposed to. And so, when we shift it to to being utility, and I would argue that the church does this a lot that they'll look at one person and say, oh, he's really useful for the church, and they'll, they'll value his life more. And I don't mean that they go kill the other person. I mean the effort that they put into it, the, the desire for them to grow. The, you know, there's, there's real partiality in the church that, that ends up going, not this person's valuable because they're made in the image of God, but this person's valuable because they have this value to the church. They show favor. To the, I mean, they just, I mean, there's, there was a, recently there were a number of people who run large YouTube channels where they talked about the fact that 
they get a lot of gifts from people. And some of them were physically attractive. Some of them were, I mean, but they were, they were popular. And they said, people send them money. They said, people were just sending us money. And they were just, you know what I mean? And there was just, so, I mean, there's just this part of it where one of the things that human beings do is we look at people and if we like what we see, we show extra favor there. And so, I mean, and this is, and that is not something that is fundamentally a value of life. That's a value of beauty. It's a value of what makes me happy. It's a value of what pleases. I mean, it's a value of all these other things. And so it's, it's something that we fundamentally have to war against because it's part of human nature. And something we need to watch for. I was in a church where this was happening and I didn't even see it, even though it was happening under my own nose as an elder of the church. And I was being warned about it by people, but I dismissed their concerns when their concerns ended up being very well founded, that they're saying there's people in this church that that certain elders won't do anything with them because they see no utility to themselves. This is one of the things that went on during the coronavirus because there was a part of it where there were a lot of churches that were suddenly, the elders shifted the service to being remote. And the people who suffered the most in those cases were the people who were already sort of remote by nature. Whether they were isolated for different reasons, whether they couldn't, whether it was harder for them to come out, whether they couldn't fellowship as much, but all of a sudden now they're isolated. And there are a lot of elders who, during that time period, they didn't, they weren't much of a shepherd to those people. And, and this, I mean, and it really, it, it demonstrated the attitudes of the church towards its, towards the flock. And so, I mean, there's this, there's this part where, again, when you're looking at things, when you're looking at attitudes, when you're looking for and say, how do we not have the right, the right view of life and a culture of life? I actually don't think you have to look very far. And I think that's really important to recognize because I think that's one of the things that the church has lost that coronavirus made very obvious, which it's lost the idea that members of the church are supposed to value one another. And so basically when the church broke down and they said, we'll do it over Zoom, Everybody's still valuing the pastor, the preacher, maybe the song group if you have them come in and sing. But the relationship between one another, that's allowed to completely break down. And there's no thought that the church needs to maintain that. Well, that's a real problem and a real problem that's, that's showing that the church isn't valuing the body of Christ. It ends up valuing you know, the tongue of the body of Christ or whatever you right. want to say, but rather than valuing the whole body of Christ. And, you know, and it, this is a b- bigger topic, but the problem for a lot of places was they weren't doing that before coronavirus. It right. was come in, sit in the seat, you know, absorb and leave. And that's that's what that's what church was. And so they they weren't even losing that much because they didn't have it to begin with. Right. I think that coronavirus more made it obvious and actually created the situation. I think, like you said, the situation was already there. It's just with coronavirus, it becomes very obvious. This is about everybody's relationship with one man rather than their relationship with each other. These things have been going on in the church for a long time. There's been a trajectory in the church for a long time. Coronavirus, like Joshua said, just revealed, it revealed these existing, this existing lack of emphasis on things. And all of a sudden we were paying a lot more for it than we used to pay for it. And so, the, and there's, so I mean, and there's this part of where when we see the reversal of Roe versus Wade, Yes, we should look and say God did that, but I'm not sure that the I'm not 100 percent sure that the church that the church's attitude towards life is what reversed it. You right. know what I mean? And so I think there's this part of it where I mean, so it is a good thing. Roe versus Wade reversing is a very, very, very good thing. But if the church doesn't turn away from these things, it's going to become this thing that's been foisted on the nation, and it's going to be held up for pragmatic purposes it's going to be held up for things that's not driven by what god cares about it's going and and there's going to be these hypocritical disconnects like we've talked before about telling a 10 year old she has to carry a baby to term though she was raped and the church saying we don't have to have children we can have two children and that's fine and those things just they're not compatible with one another and so i mean there is a real tension that this has caused can can you back up just a little bit because i mean we're moving Logically, we're moving really quickly through some of these things. I mean, it, or illogically, one of the well, <laughs> the logical steps we're taking are are big ones. Um, how do we get from the culture loves death, abortion, etc., to the church needs to value meeting together as one of the ways that we counteract a culture that loves death? 
Right, because I think that fundamentally it is about loving life. And if we love life, we'll love our brothers and sisters, right? And that's the terminology. And when you have this fragmentation where it's where it's just one pastor and you have all these other people there that are supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ, but they don't feel like they need to maintain a relationship between them, they're basically not valuing each other's life. Because in Christ, when we're all hid in Christ, we should value each other's life even more so than if we're not hid in Christ. Even though we should value everybody's life, there's a real difference that the church is supposed to be known by our love for one another, not our love for the pastor, not our love for the church, like the building, the getting together, but our love for one another. Not and just so, our love for sermons, right. not just our love, right? I mean, for, for teaching, for singing. For, right. It's really our love for one another is how they're supposed to to know that we're disciples of Christ. And when we don't love life, we don't, we're manifesting it by not loving one another. And we're not talking about loving life in an abstract sense either. Right. I mean, and this, so this is, God is the Lord of life. I mean, if you look at the confession, it talks about that, that God is the source of all life. There is no other subsistence but by God. And so there is this part of it where what we're really saying is, is to love God, but what we're really trying to draw out of it is, is if you love God and love him properly, if your doctrine and your practice lines up, you will love life. And you will love life through all these little ways that God has built into the world that require you, like you said, to to love one another, to admo- to exhort one another to love and good works. And not like love and good works in this abstract sense, but love and good works like what are you going to do this week? How are you serving God this week? How can we work together to serve God? How can your family, you know what I mean? And, and all those things meshing together, and they, they, that is what creates a culture that loves life. Sort of the everybody wants to save the world, but nobody wants to do the dishes. It's people don't value the people doing the dishes the same way they value the person who's going out to the mission field. And they should value the person that does the dishes because that's the role God gave them. And, you know, we're talking about people in the church, but life, of course, extends beyond the church. And, you know, it's there's there's a, people outside the church that it's a lot harder to value their life um, than uh, pe- people, even, you know, the most humble church member. Um, you know, the 65-year-old drunk in the gutter. You know, it's hard to see how his life has value, you know, from a worldly perspective particularly. Um, because, you know, the world has this idea, you know, everyone's valuable, everyone's their unique snowflake that can do whatever they want to do. <laughs> but the thing is, when it comes down to it, well, what if they're 65 years old and they haven't done anything useful? How can we keep telling them that they're so precious when they've shown for years that they're not doing that and unable to do that? Um, but Christianity, you know, says that, you know, we have sin and yet we have hope to overcome it. And so even if someone... You know, even if we can't see, you know, them accomplishing great things, and perhaps they're a vessel fit for destruction, but we can also see that God created them, and if he wants to, he has the power to change them. And so we can, we can even see that they have value because God says they have value, even if with worldly eyes, maybe even discerning worldly eyes, uh, they, we see right now they're not accomplishing great things. But God has given them value, and they have the... Um, you know, I, I, not, not in an Arminian sense that they can just save themselves, but God can use them in a way that he won't use an animal. And sometimes he's used that person in a precious way just because a Christian walked by them and didn't do anything, and God used them to create guilt on that Christian that they need to repent of, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of my point before where so many things are, are hidden is we don't know what their purpose is because God, I mean, there can be so many things that God is accomplishing through very minor things that nobody, no human could possibly understand how all these pieces fit together. In their purpose, they have a real purpose in the world, even if they've spent 40 years drunk in the gutter every night. Yeah, and, and, you know, to minister to someone like that, you know, we're not ministering to them because, because they're such a great person. We're ministering to them because God made them and put their image in them and, and tells us to help, you know, the, the weakest people. And how to help sinners and to, when your enemy's hungry, give him food. And so that's the reason why, you know, we help people. It's because God says to help everyone because he made them. It's sort of like that episode from the Gospels where the, the leaders are looking at Jesus and say, hey, this lame guy over here, why is he lame? Did, did he sin or did his parents? And Jesus says it's neither. It's so that you can see what God does. 
And Wasn't it a blind guy then? We, it, uh, you, may, you may be right. We have this unnamed person who the whole point of his life is to be an example for all of us to know how God works in the world. And, I mean, wouldn't that be a great purpose in life? Right. You know, nobody knows your name, but everybody knows your story now. How about the widow that has two mites <laughs> and she's been hungry her whole life? And she throws those last two mites in, just trusting that God will feed her. And everybody could look at her and say, well, she's accomplished nothing, right? All the disciples thought that the sign of faithfulness was that you were wealthy. That's why Jesus Christ says, you know, it's easier for a a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. But all things can be done by God. And But that widow, everybody would look at her and say, she has no faith. And Christ says, I mean, he gives the purpose of the life of her life as we read it and we go, no, this is what real faith looks like. And so it's so easy for us to judge. And we see that poor person on the street and go, well, how, what use are they? And then Christ goes, tremendous. We're warned about doing this in the church, you know, in James 2, 2 through 4. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And it's easy to read that in the context of money, because that's the example that's used. And we should be concerned because I've certainly seen it with money in the church. But we should recognize it's not just money. Boy, you speak really well. Here, why don't you sit up front? Oh, you, you, you know, you're Hispanic. You have a weird accent. You sit way back in the back, right? I mean, I've seen these things you're a happen woman. in churches. You're a child. Right. You're, I mean, all, you know, all these things. Right. And so it, when we read this, we should read it broadly and not narrowly. It's really easy to read this narrowly and make it about money when I would argue that it's about anything where you're saying, I value these things far more than I value these other things that God has given them. And the answer isn't necessarily to take the poor person and say, here, you sit in this best place either. You know what I mean? Because sometimes that you can try to, right. you try to reverse things and you put this poor person in this hor- you, you put them on the spot and you put them in this, and you just, in the end, the answer is, is how do you treat each other as much the same as you can? How do you treat each other equal? And, it, not, and the same isn't, the right exact word, but how do you treat them without showing partiality? Because in the end, we have different strengths and weaknesses, and there are differences, but that difference shouldn't come into the amount of favor that you show them. And, and part of it, when we start looking at how we treat other people, it comes back to how the church treats each other. Because again, the society walks in the light that the church gives it. The church is the light of the world. And so if the church is going to disregard and say that a person doesn't have value and this person has greater value because they have greater gifts or greater money or greater whatever, then that's what the world's doing. And so we need to ask ourselves, you know, and and Paul writing in 1 Corinthians even explains you have to understand how God designed the body, that the less honorable parts actually have more honor. He says this in 1 Corinthians 12. 21 through 25. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body but the members should have the same care for one another. So when we dress the less honorable parts of our body, we wear clothes on, right? We wear underwear to cover it. And so God's saying there's a reason why he designed it this way, because the honor balances out. The less honorable parts of the body, that poor person who comes in and the church needs to feed them for two years because they don't have ability to feed themselves. They're a less honorable part of the body. But God then says, because of that, they actually are given greater honor so that the honor balances out. And so we should be thankful when that poor person comes because now we can exercise the gift of caring for the poor that God gives to Christians. You know, And, and it's very easy for us to say, no, they're dishonorable. And I think the church does this all the time. And God actually says, no, I've given them a greater honor in another sense. And so that's how you start to have everybody saying everybody in the church is treated 
you know, the same way in terms of loving them. And then the society starts to act that way. Right now, the society is not acting that way, so we should reverse that back and say, is the church acting that way? I, I'm just going to rehash a, a insight I got from another pastor once. But he said, you know, look at what Jesus says when he says that someday I will see you and I will say, you know, when I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And, and you're going to say, well, Lord, when would, did we ever do any things for these things for you? And he says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And this, this pastor looked at that and said, you realize when somebody in your church has a need like this, that person gets to be Jesus to the church. That person gets to stand there, and they get to, in a sense, mm -hmm. they're playing a role. And, I mean, what greater honor can you have than playing the role of Jesus to the people around you so that they can then exercise the gifts that God's given them to minister to you? That's one way you could say that those, those things that seem to have less honor, the person who's hungry and naked, actually have greater honor within a church body. And it's one of these things where when— when you're weak, this is part of how humility how humility pulls the church together, how meekness pulls the church together. Because if you're if the emphasis is on walking into the church and telling everyone you're doing fine, if the emphasis is on that creating this culture where you don't answer those questions honestly, you're never going to have that honor. You're never going to show that honor. You're never going to say, "Hey, I'm actually really." struggling right now can you can you pray with me can you talk with me can you can we can we do these things because in the end it requires that humility it requires that and if you don't do that the true honor is actually kept from the church and or and, that aspect of honor is right kept i mean the and there's a point where the church begins to lose honor you know what i mean there's a point where the church ceases to actually function in any way and it all becomes fake and that's what I mean is, right. is if you if you continue to create that attitude, and this is what the coronavirus kind of that's what I'm saying is this is kind of what it revealed is it revealed this lack of connection between the parts of the body because when it was disrupted, people didn't go, this is unacceptable. They went, all we need is a sermon. We can stay at home. And so there's this part of it where that honor gets that concept of that honor gets completely lost. Because the pastor still the pastor, what it's saying in one way is is the pastor gets a form of honor by standing up and speaking. And, and it, like, like the mouth, the mouth can't not mean, the hand doesn't speak ever, right? And so the mouth gets this honor. It gets this honor all the time. And that's one of the honors that it always gets. And if it's doing it, it's getting some of that honor. And so there's a, some things you can't get away with, even if you, you can't get away from, if you're just doing the basic thing. But there's other things that they become totally lost if they're not practiced. And I mean, the picture in 1 Corinthians 12 is really the picture, right? I mean, your face you don't cover, but other parts of your body, you would never go out in public without being covered. And that's kind of the picture of the church. When you have somebody poor in the church, you're supposed to cover that so that it's not, not because you're saying these people are worthless. You're saying that they have real value is why you cover it. So that they aren't hungry and they aren't starving, so that you don't go, they don't go. Yeah, you can be a Christian, you can be faithful, and you don't eat. You know what I mean? And that's that's the picture: is the church is supposed to cover the parts with less honor, and that is a means of honoring them, right? Which is the same thing that we do with clothes, right? Right. I mean, that's Paul's point. That's the same thing we do with clothes: is that as soon as you put clothes on to say I should cover these parts of your body, you're giving honor to those parts of the body. And right. You don't do it to your face, but your face has different honor than other parts of your body do. Right. It's easy to look at abortion and see how that's not having a cultural life. But I look at how we treat our elderly as a society, and it's equally bad with the elderly. That we say because they're not functional, useful for society, we should put them off in these buildings by themselves and we should separate them from the society, which is saying that they don't really have value. I mean, it's it's almost equally as bad. We're headed there really quickly with, you know, w I mean, Europe's there with just the amount of assisted suicide, which in many cases really the suicide is dictated by a medical board. And it's 
it's effectively murder. Well, we have a lot of that in the United States. It's just done by called pain treatment. Right. Where we you just keep increasing the amount of dose because the person says they're in pain until you kill them. And, you know, go, no, I was treating their pain. But the number of places where assisted suicide is legal in the U.S. is small. Right. But your point is well taken, though, about people being put away. And, and coronavirus really exacerbated that because all of a sudden you have the elderly who are put away and they're not allowed – any visitation from family who may or may not have been visiting in the first place. Um, but then, I mean, I, I have a, a coworker who um, was talking about just some of the cases that, that she was seeing in the nursing homes where these the people were in the, the home, and because of the restrictions on visitation, they weren't seeing anybody, but also because of the home's policies, they weren't even seeing staff. Staff were literally leaving food outside their door and then picking the trays up when they were done, you know, I mean, we don't treat our pets that poorly. And yet we think that this is an acceptable way to treat adult human beings. Yeah, I actually visited a, an assisted living center and during coronavirus. And of course, I was allowed to walk around in there. Um, but the, uh, the one woman like ran out of her door and was chasing us down the hallway because she was so desperate to see somebody because they wouldn't let them eat in the cafeteria. They wouldn't, I mean, right. exactly what you're talking about. And you know, you get old and you basically get put in a prison. Yeah. It's a nice prison. That was an expensive nurse or it's expensive, you know, assisted living center I was going to, but I mean, in the end it's still a prison and you're treating the people terribly where, yeah, you slide the food out, you know, basically through the bars, just like you would at a prison. Only most prisons, you have a lot more physical contact with other people. And some of these are, when you get back to the idea of the culture of this, there are people who, as they get older, they prepare for being isolated. They plan on it. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a part of it where their expectation is, is that people won't come to see me. And so, I'll, I mean, and so they have a nicer sort of prison but in the end they've they've built it themselves and they've built it they've as a group together said you're going to move here and it's going to be i mean and i can see this i can see the issues with myself where i've let i let distance be a barrier you know my wife has back problems so driving is a difficulty but i could take the kids i could just take the kids and go over and see my parents and i should do i could do that more often and i've let i can see where i've deprived my children of their of my parents wisdom of my parents time of their life, of letting them be together, and it's and it's been fundamentally really for for selfish reasons. I mean, it has. I mean, I I can't look at it and defend it and go, nope. If I wanted to do it, I would have done it. If I thought it was important, I would have made it happen. And so there's this part of it where people just by expectation, our culture, we just kind of say, this is what we're going to do. And there could be, and it's very different. It has been very different in different cultures throughout the ages, and and what that expected role was, what that expected place was, and how those practices were carried out. When, when we talk about valuing a culture of life, maybe it's worth saying we don't mean valuing life in its prime. We're not talking about let's just it, like like in a we're sense, not Spartans, right? Let's just value twenty five year olds who are. Live right. fast and, and die young and beautiful. And if, if you <laughs> exactly if you don't go there, then you have to say, well, we're going to value life in every stage that it has, including the people who are in the process of dying, the people who are aging and going to die faster than us. That's harder to do because that requires sacrifice of time and resources. And I mean. America has reached the point where we have the money to do that, but almost no society in the history of the world before has. We're pretty unique in being able to separate. I mean, there have been societies where you just go, you're old, you're too hard to feed, just go wander off and die. I mean, there have been plenty of societies. I mean, the indigenous people of, of the Americas were pretty much like that. But you look at at most cultures that have been, you know, quote unquote, Christian cultures, they were always multi-generational. And the idea that they weren't is pretty strange. And so we just need to recognize how much we've cut off. And part of it is we're not saying that at every age people have strengths, right? When in First John, when it says, you know, the young, your, your glory is your youth. To the elderly, your glory is your wisdom. And we need each other, not just, and I'm not saying that because they have value, or because they're wisdom, we should do it. But 
they are life, but God has also appointed it that at different seasons of life, you have different abilities and you have the older person should be wiser. And then, yes, at some point their mind starts to go. At some point their body breaks down. But we've separated so far earlier that when we get to that point, we're, we're just continuing what we already did. And that's where you cover with honor as well. I mean, that's where, I mean, that's, I mean, some of this goes back to one of the things Joshua said at the beginning of this, and maybe it would have been good to kind of tie off of that, was where he said, Scripture doesn't not talk about death. And when you said, you know, we, we, we don't just celebrate life in the sense of those who are young and not dying, and the reality is, is we're all dying. Mm-hmm. I mean, and so we live in a world where everyone's going to die. And so in the sense of the culture of life is recognizing that God made every part of that process and, and that those, as they move towards death, they don't become less valuable as they get closer to death, that they that you can't just cut them off and shut them out. And so you don't hide your eyes from death. You don't hide your eyes from the fact that we are all working towards death, but you don't allow that either to say, now I can diminish you in this way. And, and God's really clear that it's the opposite. You know, in Leviticus 19.32, it says, You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God, I am the Lord. It's not just saying that you kind of go, oh, yeah, they're there and we'll put up with them. No, you're actually supposed to show honor to them because of where they are and because they're an old man. And you look at, look at where we are right now with the presidency. And there's a lot of people talking about this right now. Why are these old men getting to make all these decisions? But there is this part of it where, I mean, the nation is cho- – I mean – it's really interesting that the people who have best been able to navigate the process of becoming president have tended to be fairly old. And I mean, you know, they've, and so there's this part of it where, I mean, it's at one hand, we want to deny it. And on the other hand, we can't deny it because we're forced into the reality of facing this is where we are. And this is what it means to be old. This is what it means to have wisdom. This is what it means to be able to make these types of decisions. And remember the one that, that, Joe Biden beat in the in the Democrat Party was was Bernie Sanders, right. right? I mean, Buttigieg didn't last. Kamala Harris didn't last. All these young people didn't last because they actually didn't have enough wisdom to be able to last. We can look at Senator Sanders and we can go look at how old they are. Look at how yeah you know, they have all these problems. But remember, they beat a lot of young people, right? Cruising around Facebook and you see criticism of oh we've got this senile old man as president. You should really pause if you want to participate in that because you're running contrary to Scripture. There's plenty of reasons to criticize the president, but being old is not one of them. Right. I mean, another another verse in Scripture where it's very clear that God is glorifying those who are older is Proverbs 16.31. The silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. So dyeing your hair gray. <laughs> it's not a legitimate way. I mean, and I mean, but I mean, there is this part of it where I mean, and he he puts on that qualifier there because I mean, again, you should look at our nation. There are people who have there are people there are who people have seventy year old babies, right? Who have found silver hair, but that has not been found in the way of righteousness. And so there's you know the elderly as they move towards being elderly, like Charles already accuses me of having reached. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) But as you move towards there, you should be asking yourself the question, is it in the way of righteousness? Have you been using it to develop wisdom? Have you – and, you know, yes, the younger have a duty to show honor to the elder. But the elder also has a duty to deserve that honor or to have the wisdom so that the young should show that honor. And I think both sides have said, we don't need to do it. The young have said, we don't need to show honor. And the old have said, we don't need to show wisdom to the younger. Right. And the reality is both of them need to honor the other one. And I mean, when we go to really basic things, like back to what should the church do about this? When we have the kids program and we have you know, the kids Sunday school and we have the senior saints, so that the senior saints never intermingle with the young, This is like the opposite of what Scripture says. Scripture says each part needs the other part, and instead we separate the parts so that the elderly are with the elderly and the young who have vigor in life, they're with the young fools, and we like lose all the things that God has designed in the system, and then we turn around and go, why does everybody put their elderly parents into nursing homes? Well, there's a good reason, because you haven't shown that value when they were younger. You haven't treated them like they have something really significant to offer to the young people, and they do. And this is one of the things, as, as you repent from these things, 
it will be awkward. Because there's a part of it where when you go to do something that you haven't done before, you're not good at it. And so there's this part of it where, I mean, the church should just understand, if we really seek to repent from some of these things, it's going to be awkward at first. There's going to be some part of it where we don't know how to carry some of these things out. And you should just be... This, you know, like you said, when you go start practicing hospitality and you invite over the person that you've never had over before, that's going to be hard for you. You're not going to be in your comfort zone. That's not going to be your, that's not going to be your sweet. It's going to feel a little bit uncomfortable at first. The first time you try to bring the, the young and the old together, people might sit and stare initially. But the answer is, is this is what we need to do. We need to get past these things and we need to work through it. And it's like being fitted together where God talks about the stones being fitted together. You got to knock off some chunks to get the stones to fit together. And that's what has to happen. And you think, I mean, you you talk about that kind of hospitality, but just think about, think about inviting your mother-in-law to come live with you. You know, think about that level of hospitality. You don't, you're not going to get support from the culture in this. You're not going to, I mean, you may not get pushed back, but at the same time, you're not going to get anybody who's going to be able to tell you, here's how you do it. It's going to be awkward. It's, you're going to have to reorder your house, your, your actual physical house. You're going to have to change some things to make that happen. And yet, if it's the right thing to do, it's going to be good for you and for everybody. And and that's how you do countercultural things. And, you know, I actually had that conversation with my mother today, as a matter of fact. And her first thing was, or her first statement was, well, what does Kendra, my wife, think about that? Because what you said about the mother-in-law, right? She's going, should I go live with my daughter-in-law? Won't this be weird? And so, yes, and the answer <laughs> is will. yes, and that's okay. <laughs> and people get over weird things all the time. Right. Because look at all the weird things we've accepted. A stranger changing your diaper when you're older and putting a catheter in you and trapping a thing. I mean, if, I mean, uh, we do a lot of weird things. We just have accepted them. We just have said, this is what you do. And so there's this part of it where it's like, I'm sorry, God's ways aren't anywhere near as weird as the things we're doing right now. We're just comfortable with them. And this is what it takes to change a culture, is to recognize that the things you think are normal aren't. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be accepted. We're comfortable with them because they happen away from us. Right. We're able to put them in special buildings. Talking about, though, like, you know, the older, the senior saints being with the children in the church, right, for Sunday school and things like that, it's really easy to go, but my church doesn't do that. But I was talking to a man like maybe a month ago, a month and a half ago, and he was going, you know, we're in our early 60s, and we decided that we'd go to the to the you know, newly married class because we figure we have a lot to offer the newly married class. And so, or the, you know, the, the preparing to marry class, right? It's the 20 to 25 year old class. Did they ask them to leave? No, he just said it was very odd there. Okay. <laughs> And he said he felt guilty because there were people that were living in sin that he should have confronted. And, you know, it was an interesting conversation. But he just thought, you know, why am I going with other 60-year-olds? I have a lot more to offer to a 25-year-old that just got married or is thinking about getting married than I do another 60-year-old. So it's really easy to go, well, you know, my church doesn't do this. We have our, you know, college and career. We have our newly married. We have our children. We have our senior saints. We have our middle-aged people. And I should go to my class. And the reality is your church doesn't need to change. You can change without your church changing. You can just decide, I'm going to go to them. I mean, Joshua was in an adult Sunday school class when he was, you know, eight or something. You know, you can change it. I mean, you say you can change without your church changing. And I mean, I want to I don't disagree with you, but I want to push on it a little because you are your church. Sure. If you think of yourself and your church as two separate things, that's the beginning of the problem because then you become a consumer of what your church has to offer as opposed to saying, I am a contributor to what my church has to offer. Which also means don't think that your church has to change for you to change. Right. right. I mean, and that's that's the yep. loop, right, is bring it all the way around. Is I, If the church needs to change, if the church needs change in it, what is my role in affecting that change? Right. right. And, it means, and don't just think because I'm an elder or not a pastor or whatever that I can't have influence. That's just not true. And yeah. you don't have to stand up in front of the church and do anything. What we forget is so much of the Christian life is is mimetic. 
When you're growing up, you watch people do things. You see people do things. You notice things. You invite somebody over to your house, they're going to think about hospitality. I mean, it just all of a sudden they'll go, hey, maybe I should, should we be having people over? Maybe we should be having people. Just by doing it, you don't have to get up in front of the church and say anything. You don't have to make a proclamation. You just do it, and all of a sudden it has an impact. We had a guy at our church recently who was living in a trailer, and he would practice hospitality. And boy, you start thinking about hospitality when a single guy invites you to come over and feed you dinner in his trailer. You know, you think... Like an RV trailer. An RV trailer, yeah. If he can do that... not that nice. A camper. A camper. That's the right term, a camper. If he can do that with what he has, then with what I have, what should I be doing? Right. And so much of of change in churches and so much starts from the bottom and people want to say, well, let's wait for the top to make the decision. But that's not how so much change happens. It changes because people say, I should do this. So go and do it. I mean, and we're getting ready to switch over to another subject that honestly, it, it kind of blows my mind that we have to talk about this on a reform podcast. But I'm a member of a lot of different reformed groups and you actually have to talk about this, the idea of fruitfulness the idea of having children and the attitude of the church towards having children and whether you should do things to keep yourself from having, and whether the normative practice should be to plan your family and decide when you have children. That is such a common and prevalent idea in the world today. Among, among the Reformed, I don't know any part of the church where that is not a common idea, that that is perfectly acceptable. And you, you cannot find verses in Scripture that support the idea, that encourage it. All you can find are things that condemn practices of, of doing anything to, harm, to, to do it and that say children are an absolute blessing from God and a gift from God and that he opens and closes the womb. But the church's attitude towards fruitfulness is, I mean, this is why abortion came about in a real way, because the church's attitude towards fruitfulness. And I mean, and it's, we just need to recognize, you know, when we talk about a culture of death, this is where we are as a world, right? To be sustainable, you basically have to have a reproduction rate of 2.1, between 2.1 and 2.2 children per woman in order to be sustainable and not to have your population drop. Europe's at 1.6. It's killing itself off by 25% of its population every 30 years, roughly. Think about that. That's huge. And think of the Americas, right? We look at all these people coming up from Mexico and from, from, you know, Costa Rica and from all these countries. And this is basically how we're increasing our population is through that. But if you look, the population of North and South America is dying. We're not going to continue to be able to supplement our population by transferring up from Mexico because Mexico is dying. All these nations, all these continents are killing themselves because of their view of fruitfulness. You know, Asia, 2.1, but you split that because Japan has the lowest in the world. China is expected to drop in population and start to drop, dramatically drop in population because of their one-child policy for so many decades. You know, this is mostly India is balancing it out. But you just look at these numbers and you have to recognize The Western civilization, what we would call the West, is killing itself and destroying itself, the Europe and the Americas. And and why is it killing itself? Well, I would argue because the church has taught it to, because the church doesn't have much of a hatred of killing itself either by killing off its next generation. I mean, if you want to ask, when we we said at the beginning that about a culture of death, so 2.2 is the minimum required to just... That, that's just that's just to keep a level path. keep it level I think it's 2.15 or something but, but some number around but here's there. the thing if you ask yourself what for a I mean since World War II what has been the picture of the perfect American family it's two parents and two kids which means we idolized death because two kids won't do it it just will not you have two kids you're you you don't you don't maintain you have to have more than two kids. And I'm not saying, I mean, I'm just saying, if you say this is what everybody should be, and that was the picture, and I mean, and that was, I mean, it was on the, I mean, like, you got Sunday school handouts that had a picture, mom, dad, two kids, mom, dad, two kids. Our idealization of the American family will kill us. And so, I mean, when you want to ask, well, where is this culture of death? 
I mean, that's what we said we should be. We said we told everyone this is what you should aim for. And sure, there's other, but I mean, understand with the numbers that we have. I have ten. Jonathan has seven. Seven's on the way. Seven's on the way. Six, five. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I'm saying you look at the families that are coming from other. I mean, there are people who are, have a lot more than that, and that's still the average, which means there's a lot of people having zero. And so, I mean, I'm just saying when you ask we have a culture of death, that's a picture of the culture of death. We have as a culture chosen death. We want to – we can look forward and say, yeah, we're, we're done. And, you know – it does tie to eschatology. You can't ignore the eschatology of it. If you think everything's going to get worse or wor and worse, then you, you kill off the next generation. And that's what we're doing. And it's just, I mean, eschatology really matters. And your view of what the church is supposed to do really matters. And it's not like it's some secret out there, right? Genesis 9-1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He said it to Adam. He says it to Noah. It's not like he set it as some secret place where you have to like poke around the scripture and find it. No, it's really obvious. It's really blunt. It's really direct. This is the first commandment that he gives God after, or gives no after he destroys the earth through a flood. It's what he does after creation with Adam. And we turn around and say, we're not supposed to fill the earth and don't say it's full already. It's not even close to full. That's a lie that was told by the world in the seventies and it's continued, you know, the population bomb and it's continued to be sold. And it's just a blatant lie. But yet the church isn't pushing back on it. When we had our third child, I mean, the church we were in, everybody was going, you're having so many children. We can't believe you're having so many children. And, you know, we knew a, a, a uh, family that were missionaries to China that had three children. And they go, everybody, like, looks at them. And I'm going, it's not that much different here at a normal Southern Baptist church. Right. And I want to be clear. When I was saying I have 10, he has seven, I don't mean there's anything that we're doing something fundamentally righteous. I just meant... From the numbers perspective, there are people who have big families. I just meant when you do the average, you don't get that low an average. With some people having a lot of children, there have to be a lot having a lot less than that number. I just uh, – earlier this week I read an article that um, in the United States and Canada, roughly 21 percent of people have of, – of women have said that they don't have children and never intend to have children. And that they were tracking the number of people who were saying this in their teens because the idea was, oh, you'll change your mind. And what people are finding is when a girl starts saying that in her teens, she doesn't change her mind. And she goes through all her childbearing years and doesn't have children. And it's roughly one in five. And think about it. That's those are old statistics, because, for instance, in New York State right now, I think it's 23 percent of the women think they're really men. So you have to knock them out and then take another 20 percent before you can figure out how many that they'll actually be. So if we don't think that the, the gender confusion stuff that we've been teaching out there isn't going to drop birth rate, that's just insane when you have almost one out of four in New York State saying that they're a woman and a, or a man in a woman's body. I mean, it's just insane where we are. And so, you know, yeah, it's going to get a lot worse. So this is something that Elon Musk talks a lot about, but don't do what Elon Musk does and have yeah. children with a bunch of different women. That's not the message. Yeah. We're, not, we're not promoting adultery. <laughs> Which ties very good into the Malachi 2 verse. And this is God saying that he's looking at, at Judah and saying you are, are wicked people and that you're breaking covenant. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion, your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. And so we do need to tie it to, like Elon Musk, one of his children has, I believe, changed genders and said she is changing her last name to not be Musk. I don't know if it's he or she, but I mean, they're very confused. And so Musk is just like, you should produce children. And God says you should be fruitful. And fruitfulness is not just pumping out as many children as you can. Fruitful is at the same time actually making them fruitful for the world, which means to teach them the things of God, to fulfill the great commission towards your own children. Earlier you mentioned the commandments that God gave to Adam and to Noah to be fruitful and to multiply, but you realize that that's also tied up with the promises that he gives because realistically Adam and Noah – 
as representatives of, of humanity, they don't do a great job of it because, right. because of sin. Sin is what really prevents the ability to fulfill what God commands us to do. So when God comes to Abraham, God says, I'm going to do things through you. I'm going to do them. And one of the things that he tells Abraham is that he's going to be a father of many nations, that his children are going to be like the stars of the heavens and like the sand of the seashore. I mean, uncountable. And that this is the promise of what God has for this particular righteous man. And then, you know, you get David. Well, what's the promise to David? He won't lack a man on his throne. It's a, it's a promise of lineage. It's a promise of heritage. It's a promise of children and fruitfulness. And, you know, this is the thread of the promise that runs through the big story that God's telling in Scripture. But it's also the promise in the, the little stories. When you look through all those passages in the Old Testament where you meet a barren woman, and that's the sad part of the story. That's not the happy part. The happy part is when God removes the barrenness and gives that woman a child. You know, and the Psalms bear it out as well. Psalm 127, 3 to 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. I mean, I think it's really useful to consider the two examples of Scripture where Israel and Judah are freed. Because we all know about in Egypt, right, with the, with the midwives and all the births and everything. And the numbers, you look at the numbers there, and, I mean, they have to have a lot of children, like huge families, in order to, to grow a number that they did where they grew up from 70 to, to millions. But a lot of people don't think about the numbers when they left Babylon. They're in Babylon for 70 years. When they go to Babylon, I believe it's a total of 4,600 people go to Babylon. A small fraction of them, that's in the three waves, because there's three times that they go into captivity to Babylon. And in those three waves, I think it's in Ezekiel, it says 4,600. When they come back, there's three waves also, between Ezra uh, to 4, Zerubbabel. 46,000. 4,600. Okay. There's Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. There's three waves that come back as well. The total of that, and that's just a fraction of the people coming back, is 43,000 something, almost 44,000. So the fraction is 10 times the number of people that went two generations before. The reason that they say, it even says in Scripture, that the reason that they want to push them out of Babylon is they're afraid of how fast they're increasing in number, just like they did in Egypt. And when you read this, you understand that when you read Psalm 127, because that's exactly what's happening. Egypt's going, wait a second, <laughs> happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies in their gate. We're their enemies. This is going to be bad. Right. And Babylon says it. Egypt says it. But why has the church stopped saying it? Right. Because we I don't think we think that we should actually be dealing with our enemies. We did an episode on immigration where we talked about the fact that part of our attitude towards immigration is because we haven't had – so we're afraid of someone coming in and changing our culture and changing it easily with a relatively small number of people coming in. And part of that's because of the number of children that we have in our own nation is if we were actually having children, we would have no fear of an enemy coming in and changing our culture because we would be setting our culture and establishing our culture ourselves. And so there's this – yeah, there's this part of it where you don't have I – mean, it compares children to weapons. Children are weapons aimed at the world, and they're aimed at the world in a very specific way, but they're aimed at the world, and they have it, They accomplish something in the world, and they allow you to stand in the gates with your enemies because your enemies understand that they're weapons. That's why the greatest hope for America is the homeschooling movement. Because the homeschooling movement, people typically have much larger families, and they're actually training them to raise godly offspring. I'm not saying they're doing it well in a lot of cases, a lot of them just do it with some superficial Christianity. I was at a homeschool conference before, and I'm looking at the things that are taught and going, okay, these people don't actually understand the gospel. But even those superficial things are a lot better than where the country is, right? And this is, you know, they're being faithful. They're having children. They're teaching them, even though they're not teaching them the things that they should and the doctrine that they should teach them and with the understanding they should have. But the culture's shifting, 
and it will shift when you have one group of people. You know, the Democrats are always like, oh, we're going to win the abortion debate. When you kill off the next generation, you will lose the abortion debate. There's no question that it was going to be overturned at some point because the people who believe in abortion kill their children. The people who don't, don't kill their children unless, in some number. Unless you can convince the people who have children to give the children to you so you can educate them. That's how, Which is part of the homosexual movement. That's well, why they have I mean, so, the so much about It's the public education movement. But right? it's less effective than they thought it would be. Much less effective. I mean, in other words, it's one of those things where they thought if they had them, they got – but the truth is, is – Which is one of the reasons that I said the homosexual movement because what they're trying to do is drive adoption to the homosexuals because what they found out already is that the public schools cannot overrule what the parents teach them. That they can try. But if a parent says – God created the world in seven days, and they send their children to public school. They can almost never convince them of evolution. That's why still like 60% of Americans don't believe in evolution. I mean, it's very high because the reality is, is that the parents have much more influence than they think they do. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be incredibly deliberate and direct and intentional because that's how you maintain it. But at the same time, we should recognize, you know, the way you change the culture back is you have children. That's the historical way that's recorded in Scripture. I hope as you've listened to this that you've seen how many ways the church isn't embracing life the way God said to. If we really want to change the culture, we need to be the light. We need to be the salt. This is what God left us here to do. When he says in Matthew 28 with the Great Commission that we're supposed to teach him all things that he commanded, one of the commandments is be fruitful and multiply. One of the commandments is to honor the elderly. And these things, the church isn't doing a good job teaching, so then the society ends up hating the children. They hate the elderly. They hate so many people because they don't say they're useful to us. We need to be getting back to fear God, man's made in his image, and fear God because he will protect his image. Thank you for listening. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching.